With uh, Grifter's introduction there, I, I probably don't even need to get up here and talk, right? I could just sit down and we'll call it a day. So, uh, any questions? I'm not joking. Where'd you get those glasses? Where did I get these glasses? These are anti uh, surveillance glasses that an IR camera or night vision that's trying to do facial recognition gets a blur. Are they, are they shooting the light back? Not, probably not the normal light very much. How many of you have seen these glasses before, this type of stuff? Yeah, they're pretty fun to play with. Uh, they don't have an angle of incident and reflection with anything that's coming in. They send it directly back towards whatever the source is. And I got them from a guy on the internet uh, with the intention of making active versions of these. So stay tuned for that. So this is not a joke. So if you notice down on the bottom, uh, never odd or even, you may notice something interesting about this slide progression probably when we hit the middle, hint, hint. So seriously, no other questions. You guys, you guys are quiet. I'm, I'm a little tired, but I'm good. How are you guys? Yeah. So my presentation style tends to be a little different than, than folks like Grifter. I, I love communication with the audience. Uh, I don't feel like I'm Moses coming down from the mountain on high to, uh, to give you knowledge. I, I'm one of you. I think most of you in here are much smarter than I am. I'm just tenacious and I persevere a lot. So um, again, how are you? I want you guys to be a little more relaxed, make a little noise, talk a little bit. Hello, hello. Hi. You guys really suck at this. Yeah. How many of you are excited to be here? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do a little thing that I always do. How many of you who are here are students? And not the trick question like, oh, we're all students of life. Yeah, I get that. No. How many of you are, on a, how many of you are high school students? Do we have any high school students here in the audience? We got a few. How many college students? How many recent graduates? How many folks are looking for work? Not a joke. Raise your hand. How many folks are here to hire somebody? Now let's do that again. How many are looking for work? <laughs> How many are looking to hire somebody? Connect with each other. That's to, to help you guys out. That's, that's the reason you come to conferences like this. You should be helping each other out. How many of you are from Utah? Okay. How many are from outside the United States? Do we have any? Foreign? I got one, one or two. Where are you from? Yell it. England, the UK. Anyone else? Any other countries? Did I see one more? Can you? Where are you from? Bangladesh. Uh, let's see. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think I love you is Ami Domake Balabashi. Whew. Thanks. You can clap if you want. Yeah. So in the process of going through this talk, you're going to learn a little bit more about me in the, the weirdness that I am. So uh, there are reasons. Um, how many of you have your awesome, awesome conference badge on you? You guys need to give a huge round of applause to this con for having such an awesome badge. Give them a round of applause. For those of you who don't know, I've been cursed as the badge guy by a lot of folks, and we'll get into the reasons for that later as you see the structure of my talk is a little uncouth. Uh, how many of you noticed uh, some weirdness on the back of this badge? Yeah, how many of you recognize what that is? How many of you recognize the language? So somebody asked, that's kind of a good segue. I would encourage all of you to take a moment and ponder it, if not, not even if you're interested in the game, but just as a form of exercise for flexing your mental muscles and your hacker sleuthing slash internet skills, try and identify what's going on on the back of the badge there. I will tell you it's a little puzzle game that I may or may not have put together with uh, a couple other folks who are here. And uh, if you would like to try your metal at some of the stuff like Grifter had mentioned, um, there may be some of that going on here. I also know that SaintCon has a, uh, a, what are you calling it, the danger room downstairs? or the vault, so give that a try. Don't be afraid of that stuff. I encourage you to participate in that, and I'm gonna get into the reasons for that 
more later. So, curious. I have a bit of a beef and a problem and sorrow in my heart for the younger generation. How many of you in here were born in the 80s? How many of you were born in the 90s? 2000s? 60s? No one wants to admit it, right? So, something interesting. 70s? 70s. <laughs> if I said 70s, I was going to have to do some kind of weird uh, Saturday Night Fever dance, right? And I just, you don't want to see that. Um, something, both for all things good and evil, something happened to those of us that were computer geeks back in the day with my Commodore 64 with the 300 baud modem that stuck to the back of it with the acoustic coupler and our BBS dialing and war dialing, the early days of, of computer geekery when you seriously were a geek if you had a computer because not everybody had them. This magical thing was invented by Al Gore called the internet. <laughs> and along with the internet came search engines, data aggregation, instant gratification was magnified. And I have this personal crusade and that is, I want to bring back mystery and magic to the world. And now, why do I say that? When I was a kid, I used to love watching magic tricks because I liked to sit and think about how they were done. I wanted to know what the mechanism was by which they were deceiving my mind. How was misdirection applied? How was the social engineering aspect applied? Uh, side tangent comment. And by the way, I'm very helter-skelter with how I talk, so please stay with me and forgive me for that. Um, I actually taught a class at university where one of the assignments was I showed professional magicians tricks, and they had to identify all the uses of social engineering in, in the magic tricks. You know, it's a good uh, source material for those of you looking to learn that type of stuff. But anyway, um, when I was a kid, I used to like to wonder, I, I take stuff apart. How many of you guys take stuff apart or did as a kid? So along with the internet and this instant gratification and this instant access to, to uh, knowledge, we also started getting to the point where electronics, um, and, and this is over time, electronics for a while were very, very expensive. And so what, is your, what do your parents say when you get a new device? Be careful with it. It's electronic, it's expensive, or it's dangerous. And so we used to have this generation of tinkerers and hackers and kids that would think about how are things done, and we've come to this generation, the generation that does this. And that's all they do. Go to a magic show these days. Any magic trick that's there, save very few exceptions that I, um, we could talk about later or offline if you'd like. Um, I can find a source online of how stuff is done now. So these kids don't have to sit and think about things anymore. They just pull out their phone and get the instant answer. And I would argue that's both good and bad. Because I have instant access to all this data through my phone or through my computer, I don't have that space of time where I ponder and think about things. I don't have that magical aha moment when I figure things out. Grifter mentioned several of the things that I had done through, through DEF CON through some challenges and some other conferences. What I'm trying to do is create those epiphanal aha moments opportunities for other people because they don't exist in the world anymore, or at least not like they used to. And so I have to create things that are Google-proof, which is an interesting problem space if you think about it. Because the first time you do any type of puzzle contest with really smart people, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go Google it, or they're going to Google information about it. How easy is it to Google this? It's a little more difficult. It's still possible, but it's a little harder. Um, for most of my challenges, too, I will, did I lose, oh, I thought I lost the screen. I will Google proof my stuff by testing my own process and seeing what comes up on hits and what path do I think people are going to go down, which, by the way, you can also use as a form of misdirection. But anyway, Curious, you've, you've seen this, Curious Code C is a company that I formed with some very close friends and my brother um, to help do this because I have been doing this for what is it, over 20 years now, creating puzzles and cryptographic challenges for hackers all over the world. And uh, I want to make it more accessible to a larger audience because I think it's sad that this younger generation doesn't have that aha magic in their life anymore. 
and I'm hoping to try and bring that back. Anyway, so that's the C on your badge, if you worry about that. You guys still awake? Yeah. So riddle me this. Grifter uh, also mentioned, it's funny, we, we share the same brain, I guess. Um, the, the advent of AI. How many of you know what uh, the CyberGround challenge is? Raise your hands. How many of you are hacker tech geeks that hope to work in InfoSec and security of some form or flavor? How many of you don't give a damn? <laughs> yeah. So, personal apology. The people that I call nine to fivers who are not passionate about what we do, I'm not really here to talk to you because I don't understand you. I don't understand you because I don't understand somebody that would do for a living something that they're not passionate about or find a way to be passionate about it. I have been an InfoSec for a long time. There will be more of that later in the slide. But I live this stuff. I think about it all the time. It's built into me. It's baked into the mold. I can't take it out of me. Those are the people that I'm here to talk to today. The other folks that are here, I put some things in my slide deck for you to take back with you. So you're welcome for that. And I apologize, but I don't know how to talk to you. Um, full disclosure. So what this is, is the Cyber Grand Challenge. This was InfoSec's attempt at pitting computer against computer for attack and defense. And it happened at DEF CON um, in kind of like, a, it was more like a side room. Um, and it was sponsored by DARPA. It was a lot of money, a lot of very intelligent people involved. And we had racks of servers. And basically it was, think like CTF. You had a rack that was your network and you got to attack and defend. And it was all automated. So you basically put the racks up and flipped on the switch and let it go. And it's the first time that this has been done. That machine is now in the Smithsonian because that was the first time this was done. The thing you see on the right is the black badge that I created uh, with the help of some very talented people. So yay, one of my creations is in the Smithsonian. So yay me. Yeah, you can clap, it's okay. <laughs> and by the way, I was paid what I believe is to be one of the highest compliments. Number one, being asked to be able to put anything on the SaintCon badge because I understand how much work and sweat goes into these. A lot of you guys that come to these cons, oh, here's the cool little thing that somebody put together. You need to have a full appreciation of the labor of love that something like this is. And the fact that I was given last night from Troy a black badge from St. Con is a big deal to me. And those in the community will understand that. So anyway, that's mayhem. And uh, I agree with Grifter completely that AI is never going to solve a lot of the problems because you got weirdos like me running around who are going to think about things that are outside the scope or the vision of those that are creating these other systems. And it will be a cat and mouse game. For the longest time, we dealt with like AV and we had signature-based detection, right? And how hard is it to take something that's signature-based, alter my signature, and then keep going? And we used to do fun things like uh, uh, there was a guy, uh, XLogic in, in uh, Arizona, uh, used to take AVs, because you know when an AV signature triggers, it hashes it and then quarantines it so that it can keep it on your system, but it's also locked down. So we, he would take, uh, he would create a hash that was half something that would trigger and the, the opposite direction, I don't, I, I, I don't want to go into the gory details. Long story short, when it would hash it, the hash itself would recreate the original exploit or something else that would also trigger and flag and it was done in such a way so that it was cyclical and it would fill up your hard drive so as your av would trigger then it would hash the hash function would produce something else that would trigger that also when hashed would then continue the cycle and so it would basically quarantine over and over and over again and fill up your drive so anyway stupid stuff like that you know david letterman stupid pet tricks anybody know what i'm talking about when i say that yeah, so we would do like stupid computer tricks like that. Apologies, this is a soapbox moment. You can tune out if you want. Go ahead and nine to fivers, pull out your phone. I'm sure there's some email you need to check. How many of you know what the nine dot problem is? Raise your hand. 
How many of you have never heard of the nine-dot problem? And then I would argue that tangentially you've all heard of it and don't realize it. So I'm going to explain to you the nine-dot problem, and you're all going to do it with me. It's a little puzzle. You have nine dots. You have to connect all of the dots. You only get four straight lines, and you can't lift your pen off the paper. This is old. It's, you've probably seen it when you were in, like, grade school. So why am I bringing up the nine-dot problem if it's a simple puzzle and I think it's stupid? I'll tell you why. Because this puzzle is the origin of the phrase, thinking outside the box. How many of you have heard the term, think outside the box? Everyone should raise your hands, right? You all speak English? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I, on occasion, have been accused of being creative with all of the stuff that I do, with the mystery challenges and all that. I have a real beef with the view and perception of creativity, which is what we as hackers or computer or security researchers are seeking after. And that is the assumption that if I do something as simple as take the nine dot problem and I tell you, you're not going to be able to solve that if you mentally have imposed a box around those nine dots. And in, in this case on the graphic, I even put a white border around it. I could have used white dots instead to further push the heuristic or the, the mental limitation that you imposed upon yourself. Because your average person who's never seen this puzzle, usually younger kids, will take the, the, the nine dots and they will start drawing. And they will usually start in a corner and they will get three of the sides and then they get stuck because you only get four lines. And you can't lift the pen off the paper. And then the magical epiphanal moment supposedly is when someone comes and tells you, well, you don't have to stay in the constraints of this imaginary box. You can go across a line and then extend past one of the sides and then cut a diagonal down and then go across and then back up, which is one of the solutions. One of the more clever solutions is, notice the dots, we're not, I, I am a mathematician, but in the context of this puzzle I'm not, those dots are pretty darn big circles. I'm pretty sure if I get a straight edge, I can take a line diagonally across those top three at an angle, tilt it down, go back through the middle three, and get another one and go through the other three. And if I have to, I can stretch out past the edges of that imaginary box and still get all of them with three lines, not four. Does everybody see that? Yes. So you have a number of folks like Tony Robbins and all these motivational speakers who are going around to corporate America, talking in schools, colleges, and talking about, I'm going to teach you how to be creative, how to be creative thinkers and creative problem solvers. And I'm going to show you the nine dot problem. And then I, like Moses from him high, I'm going to come down and bestow upon you the knowledge that you have to go outside the square. But a study was done that showed with proper control and proper uh, subjects, the same people that couldn't solve this puzzle without being told that still couldn't solve it having been told that. Now think about that for a minute. It wasn't this magical piece of information that unlocked their creative potential and their magical, I, I don't know what the motivational speakers are thinking when they, they say this, like, you need to think outside the box, get rid of your heuristics, and get rid of the limitations that you impose upon yourself. The same guys that did the study that showed that they didn't statistically improve the number of people who could solve this problem by just saying, you can draw outside the box. Sometimes they would say, you have to draw outside the box, and the same people still couldn't solve it. Now that should blow your mind. Furthermore, they could improve statistically, and the way they did that was by taking subsets of the problem. If they took a control group, and they took like four squares and narrowed down what the constraints were in terms of what they had to accomplish, so like a mini version of this puzzle, so that they learned the mechanics of thinking about this type of puzzle, then they could. This ties back into what I was talking about, magic being dead in the world. If I have the ability to jump on Google and to get that piece of information, which is the I can draw outside the box or I must draw outside the box, it still doesn't give me the deep thinking, the study, and the pondering about the problem space 
that is what really, truly produces those epiphanal moments. So I would argue that we are shortchanging a lot of this generation that's upcoming, and ourselves now because we're training ourselves out of it. And that is, we don't have deep study on subjects anymore because of the fact that we have this instant access to information so quickly that's robbing us of those epiphanal magical moments, which is exactly why when I create puzzles, I make them in such a way that you have to sit and think about them. You can't just go and get a piece of information that gives you instant gratification. So that is my... My, I hate the term thinking outside the box, and I apologize if you use it. The reason I hate it is that it implies that there is some little nugget of information that will all of a sudden empower you to be, to have an epiphanal moment. And I would argue that it's exactly the opposite, that it's study of the problem space. And the same thing applies to those of us in InfoSec, especially hackers. No hacker is going to be able to be told um, I can't even think of a good example. Um, if you're coding that, like, uh, uh, okay, let's say C, uh, people that have problems all the time with uh, dereferencing pointers or something, just being told that is not going to magically make them a great C programmer. It's not going to solve some problem for them. It's study of that language that's going to do that. Anyway, you guys with me on that? Yeah? Sorry. You guys are still too quiet. It makes me nervous. Oops. I don't know what I do. So, as promised, here's one of the nuggets for those of you who are 9 to fivers. Go to GitHub. Look up Chipsec. Chipsec was created by some very smart guys that I used to work with when I was at Intel. Chipsec is a tool that is going, it is basically a framework, much like Metasploit is, but at the hardware level. Uh, it runs on Windows, Linux, Mac, OS X, UEFI shell. I would, I would recommend you go look at this tool and start playing with it in your own environments for various reasons. BIOS validation, those of you who have data center issues, this is a great tool for finding out if, if the BIOSes on the systems that you're using are actually worth their salt. While I was at Intel, I was actually pushing to create a ranking system so that we could rank uh, motherboard manufacturers and BIOSes based on how well they were designed and how they implemented things. You all know that there's a lot of great tech out there for helping secure your data centers, like uh, baked into the hardware, like Intel's TXT. Who knows what that is? Very few people. There's another point for you to go look at. Uh, I do that a lot, too. I will throw things out there not meant to insult you if you don't know what it is, but it's stuff that if you're in the industry, you might want to look up. It might be good for you to know about. So I try and give you those hook points so that you can go off on your own, because I don't want this to be a talk about TXT, for example. Trusted execution. Chipsec is a tool, much like Metasploit, for you guys to go play with your hardware, especially if you have Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. So I know all the hackers in the audience who haven't heard of this are going to go get it and go play with it, and the rest of you don't really care, and I'm not here to talk to you, so... I have a disclaimer. I have a real, real problem with... How many of you guys in here are pen testers? Red teamers. Security analysts. You're the security guy where you work. You're the database administrator who's also been told you're the security guy where you work, <laughs> which is a lot of shops. Um, there are a lot, of, like, as Grifter noted as well, I hate you taking all my thunder. Yeah, I love you too. So does Trevor. Um, there are a number of snake oil salesmen in our industry. And I, um, I, I picture them like the two guys from uh, Pete's Dragon. How many of you seen Pete's Dragon? Remember the guys in the wagon that are selling the snake oil that want to make uh, dragon potions and stuff out of the dragon? That's what I see when I go to the vendor areas of like Black Hat and RSA and stuff like that. I see the guy with the mustache and the top hat come out. I got AI, it's gonna save you. You know, I've got this device that's gonna save you. And what do they always say to the folks who have the, that make the budgetary decisions? You're gonna be able to reduce head count. Come on with me and buy this box and go fire those five guys over there. So that's happening a lot in our industry. So, what I won't do is say that there are magical tools for things. What I will do is tell you some tools that are 
what I believe good things, like Shodan. How many of you know what Shodan is? See, I'm amazed how many know what Shodan is, but don't know what some of the other stuff is. Shodan is passive collection. It's a way for you to do a lot of your enumeration without putting noise on the wire. It's great. Nessus. How many of you know what Nessus is? How many of you believe a system is secure because you ran Nessus on it and there are no criticals or highs? <laughs> I will tell you, there are a lot of people, and I will also tell you a lot of folks that say, I've gotten rid of the highs and criticals. I'm good. I will also tell you that on security assessments, that guy right there and myself and several others, the first thing we look at, if, if they have Nessus scans, we say, can I see your Nessus scans? And they hand them to us. I go straight to the mediums. Why? Because their admins aren't paying attention to those. There's a couple reasons for that. We don't have enough headcount. We don't have the time to deal with it. I'm too busy worrying about the criticals. Huh. That also means a lot of those mediums have been around a long time. Which means if you've developed a technique or tool that takes advantage of something that you're going to start finding in a lot of other systems, hey, all of a sudden the medium seems like a more important. And, and I know what you're all thinking. Some of you in this audience are sitting back and going, I hear you. I agree with you. I don't have the hours to do it. I don't have the people to do it. I'm going to talk about some philosophy in terms of how to fix this problem moving forward. Uh, how many of you know what the, the little dragon logo is down here? What is that? What was it before? Thank you. I still call it backtrack. Know your roots, people. I mean, what's the, what's the guy on the right? Matt Esploit. I would like to personally, once again, tell H.D. Moore that I hate him. No, I really love him, but I hate him for doing the Metasploit rewrite in Ruby because I think he single-handedly brought Ruby back from the dead in our community, and I hate him for that because I hate Ruby. <laughs> Python! <laughs> Thank you. Pearl. I heard Pearl. <laughs> I, have to, I have to comment about this. Uh, everyone knows there are religious wars about languages. Pearl... If you want to convince someone you are freaking elite, take your keyboard, have them look away for a minute, say, I'm going to write some Perl code that's going to blow your mind, but you can't watch. Have them turn their head, put your fingers on the keyboard, and go, <laughs> smack random keys, including punctuation, and then go, here, it's Perl code. And they probably won't be able to tell you it's not. <laughs> Those of you who've programmed in Perl, you know what I'm talking about. Which, tangent, what, I'll, I'll give you my favorite programming joke. Everyone hates it. I love it. How many of you guys have programmed the prologue? Or am I that old? A few, okay. This joke is for the few people who just raised their hand. How many prologue programmers does it take to change a light bulb? No. <laughs> if you've programmed in prologue, you'll get that joke. Moving right along. So who am I? Wow, that's usually the start of the talk. Huh, so I put up a few things to, to help give you, like, why the hell should you listen to me? Who is this idiot that's up on the stage wearing the funny glasses and pacing back and forth and drinking the water and talking too fast because that's how my brain works? Um, I put the little crypto guy on the side there. That was actually drawn by my wife. That's a representation of the crypto-y stuff. I do have a degree in computational mathematics. Um, it is one of my loves and my passions is cryptography. And uh, a comment, again, Grifter, we talked about the women in MFSEC. You missed one. You missed a really awesome one. Elizabeth Friedman. Raise your hand if you know who Elizabeth Friedman is. Wow. How many of you know what the NSA is? Okay. How many of you know who Mr. Friedman is in regards to the NSA? Wow. Those of you guys that want to be hackers, you should know this stuff. Look it up. I will tell you, for the longest time... Friedman Road in Maryland and the Friedman Building at NSA, those are all named after Mr. Friedman. And I will tell you that behind the scenes, the real crypto power was Mrs. Friedman. And there is a book that was just released, I think this week, that talks about her life. It is amazing. If you have any interest in cybersecurity at the nation state level at all, I would suggest you get that book because it will give you an insight into why the intelligence community does a lot of stuff that it does as far as crypto and covert communications are concerned. She is an amazing woman. She is basically, if you asked me to summarize, she's the founder of the NSA, really, not him. 
Think about that. And how many of you had not even heard of her? Uh, Elizabeth Friedman. The picture in the middle is to represent I am DEF CON's official cryptographer and puzzle master. I created the Hardware Hacking Village together with Russ Rogers. I created the Mystery Challenge at first, and this is a little side story for you about how that happened. Again, Grifter mentioned, just get out there and do stuff. My very, very, very first DEF CON, I was a very young man, nervous. I'm going to go to this elite hacker conference, and all these guys are going to be super smart, and I'm just a dumb kid. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I don't know what to expect, but I heard there were contests. So I competed in a contest, my very first DEF CON, and it required work ahead of time, and this is way a long time ago. So it doesn't sound like much now, especially with all you guys with your magic Arduinos and everything else. But I had taken a plastic skull, and I had embedded a web server that was, that was not like putting a PC in the skull. Remember, this is way back in the day when you guys, your PCs are still giant. This is all hardware built, and I wrote my own TCP IP stack so I could create dynamic web pages. This is before all of the magic that you guys have now. And what I did is my microcontroller would pull the status of registers and the pages it would serve were changed based on the status of those physical registers on the chip. So that when people would surf to this, this embedded skull, they would get a different representation of the skull depending on what state it was in. Like if the jaw was open or the eyes were lit up and I had an Emic text-to-speech module which was created by Joe Grand in it. And what I had done, what I called it, and I thought it was really cool back in the day, I had created communication from the net without a computer. Because you took this skull, you plugged in an Ethernet cable to it. We didn't have the Wi-Fi like we have now back then. And you would go to the page of the skull, and you would put a string of text in. It would send it to the skull, the mouth would open, and it would speak that text. Which is not a hard thing to do now with all the off-the-shelf stuff we had. I had to roll all that myself. And I took my little skull, I felt very much like Hamlet, you know, alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio, a fellow in infinite jest. He often bore me on his, anyway, I could keep going. No Shakespeare fans in here? Come on. <laughs> Old Bill. So I show up at DEF CON with my little skull and I compete in the TCP IP embedded device competition. Never had stepped foot in a security conference before that. And I won first place. I won a black badge and I also noticed I was the only guy there by myself. Everyone else was on teams, and I felt really nervous about what was going on. So how does that relate to the, to the mystery challenge that I was talking about? Well, I'll tell you. I got one of those epiphanal magic high moments when I won that black badge. I felt like I'd really proved myself to this security community. And my goal was to do that three years in a row. I thought, first year, they could call it a fluke. Second year... Uh, still kind of lucky. Third year hat trick, there can't be any question, I belong with these folks. I can hang with the big dogs. I'm not just the dumb kid. By the way, a lot of us in this industry talking about the rock stars, I suffer greatly from imposter syndrome, which I think most brilliant people that I know do, which is that I think everyone is smarter than I am and that I, I really don't really belong. Where like, I can't believe I'm at a conference talking to all these people. I do it all the time, and every time I step on stage, I'm like, like, I don't know this guy right here, but he probably knows a whole lot more about a subject that I don't know about. And I'm like, maybe he should be up here. What am I doing up here? But anyway, I had decided the second year I was going to enter that same competition. I had new ideas, and I was going to win that competition again, prove myself. Well, about six months out from the con, the contest is in, in existence. The guy who had created the original TCP IP embedded device competition was a guy named Neural, um, and he had kind of disappeared from the scene. To this day, I still say thank you to him, because I think that contest he started was my gateway into this community. So they, I get told this contest isn't going to happen. So I wrote Jeff Moss, Dark Tangent, an email directly. Didn't know him. And I said, I noticed that the TCP IP competition is no longer being run. I would like to volunteer to run it if no one else is going to, because I figured if I couldn't compete in it, I would run it. He says, sure, go ahead. Long story short, yes, I hate the phrase too. Um, he had misunderstood what I was referring to, the TCP IP embedded device competition, which I was referring to as the TCP competition 
He thought I meant the TCPIP drinking competition. Well, unlike my counterpart here, I too am LDS and do not drink. And so it didn't make a lot of sense for me to run a competition about drinking when I couldn't tell you the first thing about drinking. But the mismatch wasn't cleared up until roughly two or three weeks before the conference. And I get this contact from this guy, Russ Rogers. Um, yeah, sorry, there was a misunderstanding. And now we're bringing back that other competition. And by the way, you're not running it. Huh. Screw you. I did exactly what you should all do. I went ahead and did it anyway. I did this mystery challenge. And I called it the mystery challenge because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> Literally. And if I didn't know what I was doing, then they didn't know, but I learned a powerful thing. People love mystery. They love to figure things out. Again, I learned about that craving and desire for magic in the world that doesn't exist anymore because we killed it all with Google. So I created this underground competition, but I was smart and I was kind of the, the showman. I contacted guys like Joe Grand. And I contacted other guys that had a name in this industry already, and I was like, you might want to check this competition out. I hear it's pretty awesome. I hear it's super elite to the fact that it's underground. It's not even an official contest. And I basically wormed my way in to that conference. And I ran this competition, which, through blood, sweat, and tears, was very successful and propelled my career, at least in that community, to the status of where now people refer to me as the puzzle guy or the crypto guy for the conference. Um, side tangent, the boxes Grifter was talking about, not only did people cut them open, one group took the first box out into the desert and shot the back off with a shotgun, and another group, which oh, I cringe every time I think about this, they tried driving in a car on the freeway with the door open and dragging the back of the box on the road to try and break open the hinges on the back. And the reason for this was I had frustrated a lot of these guys because, you know, know your enemy. I had created these boxes. They had three locks on them. Two of the locks were locked. One was unlocked. So when they would pick the locks, they were picking one closed every time. <laughs> not only that, not only that, Intel, when they grow wafers to make chips, they float them on giant neodymium magnets because they have to have isolation from vibration. Well, eventually those wear out or they get rid of them and they throw them away. And I got my hands on all of these old neodymiums from Intel that they used to float wafers on. It takes two full-grown men to prime apart. That's how strong they are. I put those inside those boxes, which were metal, so the magnets were actually holding the lid shut. So even when they had the locks open, they couldn't open the box. So they thought it was locked. Plus, I also knew that all these guys that are like master lock pickers, which a lot of the hacker community is like, I'm a master lock picker. Okay, cool. Your lock picks are ferrous. What does that mean? It means magnets are not your friend. So when they're trying to do the fine, delicate work of a lockpicking master, which I know they all are, their lockpicks are sticking to the side of the box. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that I put into my puzzles that was, was meant for fun. Like one year I made it so they couldn't get the lockpicks into the keyway, so they had to bend their picks at a 90 degree angle so they could get them up into, anyway. <laughs> and then finally, the thing on the right is to, again, telling you who I am. Uh, I was a college professor. I, wa I was the professor of robotics and embedded systems at a private university in Arizona. And that picture is us preparing a near space balloon launch. This is also back before now everybody's launching balloons. If you haven't done it yet and you're a geek, I highly recommend it. It's totally worth it, not very expensive. Our balloon made it to 93,000 feet for our first launch. And I have pictures where I can see the curvature of the earth that, from a device that we built and sent up. And we did GPRS packet radio for tracking. We also dressed a couple students up in black suits, like men in black, so that when this thing came down, they could knock on people's door, ma'am, did something fall from the sky in your backyard? <laughs> and we actually, re we, we did a chase van and actually retrieved it when it came back down. But anyway, near space ballooning is a thing. You should try it. It's fun. St. Con, this is my first slide. Huh? You guys awake? In case you haven't figured it out yet, I'm doing a palindrome talk. We're at the middle. <laughs> no, that, that's it? That's how excited we are for... <laughs> yeah. 
come on, where, where are my geek people? Come on. I know some of you guys are the 9 to 5 I got another slide for the 9 to 5 in here, I promise. Something you can go back to your boss and be like, we found this in our network because we heard about it at SyncCon. I'm glad you spent the money to send us there. <laughs> I got you covered. So, and now you can go back to sleep, start checking your phone, and I'll wake you up when we get back to that slide. So back to my geek friends. So who am I? Remember, we just did a who am I, and then I said we're at the middle, and then I said it's a palindrome. Come on now. <laughs> Mind blown, right? I also think I'm the first person ever to do a live in-hack talk, hack challenge, which I did at uh, ShmooCon, where I had a, a, a wireless access point connected to a Kmart blue light, and whoever logged in during my talk and was able to hack in and turn on the blue light one. Anyway, I'm always trying to do new stuff because I hate sitting there and listening to boring talks. So I, I do this for you. It's a labor of love. Uh, how many guys know, who's, guys know who this is on the left? Anyone? By chance? It's Ray Kurzweil. Uh, fun story about people who are super rich and really weird. Ray Kurzweil was being inducted into the Da Vinci Society for Thinking that my university I used to work at uh, had created. And by the way, Kurzweil has done amazing stuff for both AI, speech recognition, video. Those of you who have apps on your phone where you look at a language and it translates real time, you have that because of a lot of the work that, that his guys did. But anyway, he's obsessed with living forever. And he has this guy that travels with him that's a pill wrangler that feeds him supplements at certain times a day. But anyway, one of his requirements is he had to have this special water before he showed up. And it was like a couple hundred dollars for like a small case of it or something. So, of course, the, universe, the university said, sure, because that was like his green M&M, for those of you who know that reference. Um, so he comes, he does a thing. I got to talk with him, real interesting guy, super smart. Uh, wrote a book called The Singularity is Near, Kurzweil, synthesizers you've probably heard of, stuff like that. But anyway, he left. He never drank any of that water. So the minute he left, being the hacker that I am, I walked over. The dean of the university sitting at the table. I walk over. I bust open the water, and I start drinking. The dean's like, whoa, you know how much that costs? And I was like, yeah, that's why I wanted to taste it. <laughs> I wanted to see what $100 a bottle of water tasted like. And he's like, so how does it taste? And I was like, you know, like water. <laughs> you know, it's wet. Anyway, who's the guy in the middle? Michio Kaku. Somebody's got, come on, you guys, wake up. It's Michio Kaku. How many of you know who Michio Kaku is? He's a physicist. Uh, short story with him. He was also being inducted the next year into that same society. And being the geek that I am, whenever these visiting folks would come and they would ask the faculty who wants to be their tour, I was like, me? That's Michio Kaku. He's a freaking genius. I want to hang out with him. He's like, you know, Einstein, look, he's even got the hair going on almost. And like, I'm an uber geek. I was almost a physics guy and then realized I wanted to eat. So I got a degree in math and engineering instead. But um, brilliant, brilliant guy. He's also a futurist. And I asked him an interesting question. I said, Dr. Kaku, what is it that we're not teaching students in our universities that they need to know? What's the single most important thing? And you know what he said really blew my mind for someone who is a scientist and a physicist and a futurist. He said, we're not teaching them how to talk to people. We're not teaching them how to talk to the press. And we're not teaching them how to talk to each other, to bosses, how to interview well. Their interpersonal communications are lacking. And he gave me the example of the Hadron Collider, which you've all heard of, right? Yes? And you all know that we had started building it here in the States right? Yes, you didn't know that? Most people don't. How many of you know we had already dug the hole for lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money? How many of you understand the magnitude of a project like, how many of you seen the movie Contact? Yeah, remember like super expensive science project? That's basically what you had in real life. And what had happened was they had broken ground and dug the hole for this collider, which if we had it here would be amazing. Now it's in Europe. Thank you, Walt. Uh, not knowing how to talk to people, and a particular scientist who shall remain nameless, you have Google, you could find out, I don't want to shame somebody publicly, but Google will, um, he was asked by a, uh, a reporter, what do you hope to accomplish with this giant engineering uh, the thing that you're building that's costing taxpayers all this money? Because it would have been awesome for us in the U.S. to have that for all of the science that it's giving us, looking for Higgs boson and all that kind of stuff. 
And he goes, I'm hoping to find God. Which, to me as a tech geek, I want to know more about what that comment means. I want to talk to him about it. Uh, I wanted to see what his thoughts were on that. And I understood where he was going with that because in physics, a lot of folks talk, like Leon Lederman wrote a book called The God Particle, and they're talking about searching for a lot of this quantum stuff that they believe is the mechanics of how the universe is built. But he didn't present himself well. That one comment, much like Trevor the Roach, blew up not on social media, but on media to the point where that project was scrapped here in the States. And they took the money to fill the hole in that we had already dug to build that collider here in the States. And now it's in Europe. And we don't have it here because of one guy's comment. One, one roach can make a difference, I guess. But anyway, his comment was, we need to teach people how to talk to the press and how to communicate with each other. Uh, guy in the last eye on the end, and you want to know who that is? That is, by some people's account, the world's best juggler. His name is Jason Garfield, and uh, he's a really nice guy, but he has this bad boy persona in the juggling world, because I know when you think about competitive juggling, you think about the bad boys of the sport, right? <laughs> um, he is on this crusade to show people, and there's a reason for this comment, he is on a crusade to show the world that legitimate, real, professional athletes are jugglers, or jugglers are professional athletes. To do the stuff that he does at the level he does, there's things he can do that only like five people in the world can do. You know, everyone worships Michael Jordan for slam dunking and stuff. And I would say Jordan isn't as coordinated as that man right there. Yet, we look at juggling as a thing that we do at kids' parties dressed as clowns in order to entertain people. And it's looked at something like for little kids. The reason I make that comment, it's the same thing that we all suffer in our industry. We're the nerds, the geeks. We keep the computers safe. And we kind of get shoved off in a climbing IT crowd. Where do those guys in the show? Where are those guys? They're in the basement, right? And there's all the jokes about the nerds that don't shower and et cetera. But anyway, my point is, is that we're freaking awesome. You guys are awesome. You're awesome that you're at a conference for like this, even though a lot of you are still being really quiet and it's making me weirded out. But, <laughs> but anyway, Trevor. So disclaimer. How many of you know what that is? I have one in my pocket right here. We're in mourning for Trevor. So I always give a disclaimer at the start of my talks, and since we're in a palindrome, and this is technically like slide two or three, I forget which one. Um, still no reaction from that, huh? You know how hard that was to try and figure out how to do properly without boring you guys to death? I know how it is being bored in talks. I know death by PowerPoint is a thing. So anyway, the disclaimer, the reason I brought this particular badge to show you and to talk about this particular one is I will never advocate any illegal activity. But <laughs> I will not refrain from sharing anecdotal stories that may or may not toe that line a little bit because that's what we do, right? I mean, that's how my brain works. That's why I'm paid to do what I do. I'm paid to do these things because I can't help myself. You go, here is your set of constraints, and I say, okay, how can I screw that in a way that you haven't thought about? So this is uh, the, the, bla the black badge from a couple conferences ago. Um, but the fun thing about this one is it has six different radioactive isotopes on it. Hmm. Wow. Which, which uh, I'm, not, I'm not stripping. How many of you know who that is? Nobody? <laughs> you may watch the show Stranger Things. I work for the Department of Energy. That's why I was showing you the shirt. But anyway, you guys didn't get it, and you're back asleep. Nine to fivers, your slide's coming. Um, the glass marble on the bottom is uranium-doped glass. The, uh, the little skulls on the front underneath them, there is yellow cake, pitch blend, and a, and a bunch of other fun things which shall remain nameless for a moment. The base itself is a Lichtensphere etching. Anybody know what that is? When we did the very first space exploration, they were sending up the very first uh, capsules that we were sending just to get out of the atmosphere and come back down. They found they had these weird etchings in the glass. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. Turns out if you take an insulator, acrylic, and you run it through a particle accelerator, and you charge the crap out of it, even though it's an insulator, it will hold a charge. And then, and you can feel it on this one, if you guys come to the room or wherever we're at, I'll let you feel it. 
if you spike discharge it, it's exactly the same thing as a lightning strike because you have all that energy and then it discharges all at once. And I don't know if you can see it in the picture very well or not, but this is captured lightning. And they learned about that process in the very first uh, space exploration, uh, the, the experiments that they were doing. And there's one old guy who's retired now who holds a patent on how to do this. And so it took some social engineering and hacker dumb to get him to agree to get me, to get me these uh, lichten spheres, which I used as the base for these. The skulls here have tritium vials in it. How many you know what tritium is? How many you have guns? This is Utah. I'm sure a lot of you guys have guns. Be, be I'm not like profiling. How many of you have guns with the cool sights that glow in the dark? How many of you noticed that those sites don't have to be charged up like your old t-shirt? How many of you know that's tritium in there? It's, a, it's radioactive material. How many of you have watches that have the same thing, some of the higher-end Rolexes and things like that? How many of you have ever seen these exit signs when the power goes out? These I would have to check. Most of the exit signs in buildings have radioactive material in them. That's why they continue to glow even if the lights go out. Side note, did you know that when you build a building and you get those exit signs, you don't actually buy those exit signs. You are given a lease and permission from the National Reg the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to have those signs. And technically, when your building goes down, you are required to give those back, which nobody ever does. I'm sure they go into landfills and things like that. Just like kids, the, the kid that built the breeder reactor by harvesting the nuclear material out of the smoke alarms. Anyway, that's a different story. Why am I talking about this? So, Trinitite, I mean, you know what Trinitite is. I mean, you know your history, World War II. Okay, first atomic testing that happened when you had Richard Feynman, one of my heroes, and uh, a few other folks that were there, Oppenheimer, when they did the first testings in Nevada, when they would do a nuclear explosion, it would create this, uh, for lack of a better term, glass. That stuff's radioactive. There is some of that from the original blast site in every one of these. The, the signature, the radioactive signature of that material can be tested with proper equipment and the distance from the epicenter of the blast can be determined. Why do I care? How many of you have an RSA token? How many of you have some other form of two-factor authentication? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. I've got this thing. What's the point? It's something you have to have, right? What if I don't tell you what the signature on this is, but I can test for it? How are you going to dupli duplicate that without actually going to the site, which is controlled by the United States military and won't allow you access? Huh. Suddenly, that's a harder problem. So that's what I used as a cryptographic key on these badges, was the nuclear signature of that material that only I knew at the time the distance from the epicenter of blast. So even if you got yourself into that site and got some of that material, you wouldn't know how far away from the epicenter of the blast to get the material. Cool, right? What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, just humor me. How many of you think that's cool? Come on. Let me ask the question a different way. How many of you would carry a piece of radioactive equipment on you in order to log into your email? <laughs> I love you people. Now, my favorite part of that story, I didn't make this, this particular one. This is a forgery that was given to me the year after I gave these out by a team of folks who worked, I think, all year long to, do, to get the right parts find the same old retired guy who owned the rights to doing the Lichtenberg etchings to do and find and source the little crystal skulls, the tritium vials, which, by the way, if you order off eBay, come in sealed packets of coffee. Um, be not illegal to own, illegal to sell. Not in the UK, also not dangerous. Side tangent, if you're ever interested, look up the story about the guy that tried to import these for keychains. Um, in fact, I thought that's what this quote is here in reference to, that uh, they do not allow licensing for toys, novelties, adornments, or consumer products containing radioactive material considered frivolous. This guy was like, it's not frivolous if you lose your keys. <laughs> it allows me to find my keys in the dark. How is that frivolous? So anyway, there's a fun back and forth between the Nuclear, Regula Nuclear Regulatory Commission and that guy about him trying to import the trinium vials, which you have in your guns, which you have in your exit signs, which you have in your watches, 
Anyway, you get the point. You can get it. It's not, you're not technically breaking the law, but it comes sealed in packets of coffee. So I don't drink coffee, so you can imagine why I ordered coffee that day. Um, anyway, yeah, this is a forgery. What does that show you? No matter what lengths you go to for your security systems, there is somewhere out in the world, in the ether, a geek like me who will take the time to break your system, which I will comment about in a second back to the we're trying to secure systems because we're trying to get a, a safer world, right? All right, nine to fivers, wake up. Check your email in a second. Get off Twitter for a second. Um, how many of you run Cisco devices in your networks? How many of you have been doing tests in networks that have Cisco devices? How many of you know what I mean when I say Cisco Smart Install? So Cisco, in their infinite wisdom, remember that discussion about lowering headcount? Cisco, love you guys, Cisco. You screwed the pooch on this one. They have a feature for remote adminning of your firewalls and your switches, your routing fabric, which is one of the primary device or technologies that you use to keep guys like me from getting in and moving around in your network. I would recommend nine to fivers, wake up just for this line, go back to your home networks and scan for port 4786. If you run Cisco gear and it's fairly, side note, put the pin down here. Um, when you find that, Google Cisco Smart Install and I will tell you there is a tool already on GitHub for exploitation of Cisco Smart Install that requires zero credentials to pull your running figs, configs of your firewalls and your routers and push. You should all be like crapping your pants when I say stuff like that. Like, oh, I can push a running config to your firewall. Think what that means. From the outside. It's no longer a firewall, now it's a router to me. <laughs> Okay, that's for the nine to fivers who may not have been following the progression. So go to your network, scan for your Cisco Smart Install. Best part about it, it's cheap and free to fix this problem. You turn it off. And it, how many of you want, let's play a little game. How many of you think this is enabled by default? Raise your hands. How many of you think it's disabled by default? You are 100% correct. You all get a prize. So why does Cisco do this? Because you can lower headcount. Right? I can remote admin all of these fancy Cisco devices and instead of paying that really expensive Cisco guy I, uh, at each site, I just have one guy. And he remote admins all this stuff because no one on the internet's ever going to scan for port 4786, Shodan. Right? <laughs> and why doesn't your AV gear or all of the other fun stuff that you pay lots and lots of money for to tell you when you're safe in your network pop on this? Because it's not an exploit. It's a feature. <laughs> if you were McAfee or Kaspersky, oh wait, maybe we shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> Are you going to detect a Cisco feature? Because then people will be like, you're giving me false positives. This is a Cisco feature. Cisco baked this in so that I can lower headcount and save money. Screw you, product. I don't like you anymore. No, it's not going to pop on that. But this is pretty much we've seen it what, everywhere we've gone so far. Anyone who has... Here's the pin that I put down there. How many of you are running old Cisco gear? Here is the coolness about that. Security through obsolescence. <laughs> it doesn't work on the older stuff. Don't upgrade if you have old stuff. <laughs> don't, don't quote me on that. I, I went to St. Con, Mr. Boss, and was told not to upgrade our Cisco gear. Wait, that's so backwards to what they're always telling me to patch. I don't know what to do now. Take it with a grain of salt. Think about what you're doing. Just Anyway, I won't tell you the name of the tool. I will make you do that little bit of work. So if you guys go scan for port 786 and you find it open, somebody could be pushing configs to your stuff. You have one admin. He is in China. By the way... <laughs> You guys don't ever plan on having like Huawei sponsor your conference, do you? No, it's not a plan, but we'll take anybody. Okay, no, the reason, <laughs> because I wasn't going to say this if I did, because I'm going to pretty much destroy any option of that ever happening, if that's okay with you. 
You guys know that some of the original Huawei stuff, if you went two menus deep, still said Cisco on the menus? <laughs> what does that mean, Ryan? I don't understand. It means they stole stuff. Soapbox moment really quickly. This goes back to the talk about design. For the longest time in InfoSec, we've been doing the Castle Moat strategy and philosophy. And by the way, how am I doing on time? Because I never even care about that. So, I might, Do you guys want me to stop? No. How many of you are awake? Nine to fivers, you can leave. <laughs> I don't have anything else for you. Well, I could make some stuff up. But um, Castle Moat, we are taking our systems these days, and we have a super awesome elite outer shell firewall ninja can't touch anything, blah, 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 and a soft, squishy inside, right? That's the castle moat design that most of our, design, our systems are structured around. And I would argue there are two types of systems in the world today, those who have been owned and those who know that they're owned. <laughs> I'm not joking. So we need to change the paradigm. We need to shift a little bit. You need to start thinking about, as you do designs and layouts and things like that, how do I stop the bleeding? How do I make it not as beneficial for someone to be in my systems? How do I make the pain go away? Here's a fun one. Yeah. Move to cloud. Move to <laughs> <laughs> I love this guy. Yes, please move to the cloud because you all know what the cloud is, right? Yeah. IoT means the internet of other people's stuff that I can use. I have a friend who refuses to get an online fridge because he knows that we will put pictures on it. Um, <laughs> we need to change from this philosophy. We need to assume compromised systems. And we're talking all the way down the to like supply chain, right? How many of you have Lenovo laptops? Remember the thing Lenovo did with, crap, my laptop had special sauce baked in before I even got my hands on it. Dang, just can't win. Uh, walking down the stack, here's a, here's a, a point to ponder for you InfoSec geeks out there who are with me still. Remember, back in the day, we were attacking application. Then we were attacking network. Then we were starting to attack OS. We're moving down the stack, right? Because what do we have now? We have virtualization. So now what are you starting to see? Hypervisor attacks. How many people have virtualized servers that are shared on a box with other stuff that I can break out? How many of you, raise your hand, think that your system is totally awesome and secure because you use VLANs. Raise your hand. Don't lie to me. I know some of you are doing it. <laughs> Virtualized VLANs. If you're not on a physically separate piece of equipment, I don't give a crap if you've got a VLAN. So file that in the back of your mind. Anyway, back to that design. You guys get the point. I don't need to beat the dead horse. We need to switch the paradigm. You need to start thinking about how to be hardened at the end point, not this castle philosophy and strategy, because somebody's going to get in. On Google. <laughs> really quickly, what is a hacker? Who is a hacker? Who is this? Somebody said it. Who said it? Carol. Lewis Carroll, Charles Dotson. What did he do? He wrote Alice in Wonderland, one of my heroes, super brilliant guy. This is a quick hacker story for you to show you that the term hacker does not just apply to us computer geeks, that it applies to people that hack in the positive sense of the word in any industry, art, whatever. Lewis Carroll, you all seen Alice in Wonderland because that's why I mentioned about your Cheshire Cat thing. Lewis Carroll was constantly having ideas in his dreams because he's a little off his rocker to anyone that would write Alice in Wonderland has got to be a little off, right? Which is why it's so good. Um, he kept having dreams in where he would have ideas of things to put in his books. And so in his day, he couldn't go just flip on the light switch, pull out a notebook and write down a note. He had to get out of bed, light the lamp. Hello, remember when he lived? Get the lamp up, get the, black, the lamp black to write the note, then he had to dis extinguish the lantern and then go back to bed. And by the time he did that process, he was awake. So he said, forget that noise. I just need to be able to write in the dark. And this is back in a day when they needed electricity. So what did he do? He created a cryptographic writing system so he could write in the dark. Not only did he make it so he could write in the dark, he made it so he could write underneath his pillow. He had it shoved under his pillow and it involved a lattice it was like, a, imagine a square piece of cardboard with letters, uh, squares cut out in rows. And that would give him his letter spacing. And then he created an alphabet called nictography or nictographic script. 
which you can Google and find, and there are fonts for it. I actually had a keyboard made with it. And he would write his notes with his head on the pillow. He would stick his hands under the pillow. He would feel that lattice work. He would feel the first hole, right, the first letter, because all the letters conformed to the outer, shape, the outer lines of the square. So it didn't matter. He couldn't see what he was doing. He could feel it. So he would write his notes and go back to sleep. How cool is that? Right? Come on, that's cool. Anyway, hackers are everywhere. Be proud of doing weird stuff. Curious, and by the way, you notice we're still in the palindrome. We're almost done. How many of you have seen the show Mr. Robot? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a fun anecdotal story, and I actually had to ask uh, some of my cohorts here. What I, I'm under obligation to not share certain things, first of all, because we are designing the ARG for season three for that show. So the stuff you see in the show, that's us. So, yeah. Thank, I'm getting there, but please don't say it that way. So how did this happen? How did Hollywood come to actual hackers and be like, let's make a cool TV show for hackers? Um, yeah, so in my day job, right now, I'm a consultant for the Department of Energy, which involves being at certain sensitive locations across the United States and other. And when you're in a secure location, you can't take your cell phone in. So a lot of times we'll leave them in our cars. And so at a particular site, which shall, I can't say the site name, can I? No. Um, so at a particular site, uh, I was inside the site. And a lot of times we'll go out for lunch and we'll leave the facility to go get something to eat. And that's usually when we check our phones, like see if my wife had texted or anything like that. And I was like, huh, 7,000 missed phone calls? What the heck? Not only that, 7,000 missed phone calls on one of my burner numbers. Side note, for those of you who don't know what a burner number is, there is an app called Burner you can get where you can create phone numbers that also go to your phone that I often do when I'm doing puzzles and things because I love to interact with people. So a lot of times in my puzzles, I encode phone numbers so they can call me at certain stages and it's like fun for me and it's fun for them and yay, it's a real person and it's not a robot or a bot. And I'll, anyway, you get the idea. One of my burner numbers that I hadn't used in like, it was almost exactly two years. Huh. Didn't think anything of it. Go back to lunch. Come back out at the end of the day. 10,000 missed phone calls. Huh. That's kind of interesting. Where are they coming from? California, New Mexico, Texas, Maryland, pick a state. Yep. Some outside the country. Okay. This is not giving me anything. Weird. So I answer one of them because the calls were continually coming in. And so I answered one and I was like, hello, click, they hang up. It's like, crap, this is like, I, like I'm getting either profiled or something. I go back to the hotel that night and I start really looking into this. Turns out my phone number was part of a puzzle I had done in a contest at a security conference a couple of years previous. And one of the writers of the Mr. Robot show, who happened to be a fan of the work that I do, was trying to pay homage to me <laughs> and put a nod to me in one of, this, one of the puzzles that was in the show. That encoded my phone number on a show on national television <laughs> that touches the lives of many, many geeks across this great country. The type of geek who will go to the trouble of decoding said numbers and call them <laughs> to this day we have TiVo and everything else yeah that's how the association with Mr. Robot happened it was them trying to it was core trying to be gracious and pay homage to me for the stuff that I had done and so now we turned the negative we turned the the uh the roach into a positive thing now we get to help make the show awesome for hackers like us at least in terms of the ARG <coughs> and the stuff that's in that show. So if you watch Mr. Robot, I hope you enjoy it. So, And they're a great group to work with. They've been really awesome. I have never seen at this level. And any questions where we started? Now, surely there are some questions after all of that, right? 
No? Too much? Overwhelmed? Want to go to lunch? Need me out of here? You guys are too quiet, for real. The number doesn't work. We'll say that again. Ami domake balobashi. How do I know that? Because, okay, I am... It's a soapbox moment. It's about three minutes. You guys cool with that? No? Go. Okay, soapbox moment. All forms of technology are communication. All forms of the stuff that we do as network security people and hackers is our communication. For example, if you're coding, you're talking to an assembler or you're talking to a processor. If you are... Anything that you're doing is communication. And so I am obsessed with communication, with as reaching as many people as I can. And I started an analysis once to see what was the most efficient way to talk to the most number of people on the entire planet with the least amount of work. And I found by finding certain key languages, both based on quantity of number of people that they touch or the tangential languages that are based on others. For example, the Romance languages have Latin roots to them. So if you speak some Latin, you can kind of, if you're a hacker, you can kind of fake your way through some of the Latin-based languages. Like if you speak some Spanish, you can kind of fake Italian, that kind of thing. And if you want to speak Portuguese, just slur a lot when you speak Spanish, right? And I don't mean that offensively. What I'm talking about is and I try to communicate with people as much as possible. So I am a huge language nerd. My personal library at home, I collect physical dic foreign language dictionaries. I have over 182 different languages of dictionaries at my house. So I study languages because I believe all forms of things that we teach other people are about communication, and that's how we're going to be better and make the world a better place. Okay. I hope you guys feel like it wasn't a waste of time. I feel badly whenever that's the case, and I hope you enjoyed it. So.